Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Dave Bossert. He is an award-winning producer, creative director, and writer. He's the former producer, creative director, and head of Walt Disney Animation Studios' classic projects. Dave, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast today. You've created some pieces of art and and work that has completely transformed my life. Um, And I know so many of our listeners are thrilled to get to get inside your brain a little bit and and learn about your unique take on innovation and storytelling. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and uh, and I'm happy to to talk about anything and everything uh, that might be of interest. It's all of interest, but I think I especially want to know what made you become an animator. What what sort of brought you to to that and to special effects? Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I think that um, uh, people, uh, when they you know, when you're growing up, you know, uh, kids are always like, "Oh, I want to be this," or "I want to be that." And uh, and the reality is, I don't think any of us really know what we're going to turn out to be uh, that young. You know, uh, uh, you know, some kids will want to be fire firemen or or policemen or uh, my brother uh, was was hell bent on wanting to become a, a pilot and an astronaut. <laughs> and, uh, and and sometimes you follow through on those things. For me, um, I, I enjoyed art. And by the time I got into high school, I uh, really focused on developing some skills uh, artistic skills. And I was fortunate to have a really great high school art teacher, which I think today is kind of, uh, in short supply. You know, I I think when school districts cut their budgets, they usually go for the arts first. Uh, yeah, but when I was in high school, I, I had this really great, uh, classically trained, uh, art teacher. Uh, he was, he was an accomplished artist himself, and he really encouraged me. And I, I really look back on that as being, you know, one of those people that really sort of pointed me in a direction. And when I got out of high school, I uh, enrolled in an advertising art program at a local college in New York. And uh, while I was there, I took a class that was called TV graphics. Now, this is pre-computer uh, days. And, uh, but it was the first time I actually created a piece of animation, uh, with my artwork where I took a piece of artwork and, and I created motion with it. Really? And what was it like? It, you know, it, it was actually kind of cool. You know, you get that big smile across your face and you're like, wow, this is awesome. And, um, you know, you start thinking of the possibilities and, and right about that time, um, uh, a friend had passed off an article to me from the New York Times that was uh, about uh, a school in Los Angeles that was training the next generation of animators for Disney. And, uh, you know, I promptly packed up my portfolio and shipped it UPS out to the school to apply. And uh, they only they only accepted thirty students a year into that program. Wow! And you know, I I thought, well, you know, you you will, you'll never know unless you try. So I was uh, thrilled when I got accepted to the program, and I also received a Disney scholarship. Um, and I packed up a Volkswagen Beetle I had, and I <laughs> I, I drove cross country. And, and I arrived in Los Angeles, I, and I remember this clearly, I, I literally arrived in Los Angeles with about $34 in my pocket. Wow. I know, it was crazy. And, uh, but I, you know, I, I wound up going through the program at, at CalArts, it was called California Institute of the Arts, and um, a, lot of, a lot of people didn't graduate from the program because they were getting plucked out of the program to work at studios, uh, notably Disney. Uh, And uh, when I graduated, I wound up getting hired at a small studio in Studio City, California, 
Uh, and I worked there for about nine or ten months uh, on some very early video games. Uh, one was called Space Ace, and the other one was called Dragon's Lair. Um, and then the company went bankrupt. And that, that was kind of <laughs> comical because they had this like studio meeting in the parking lot. The head of the studio said, well, we just run out of money, so we're closing the doors. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, and, and I figured, well, I, you know, I'm, I'll go back to New York and I'll get into advertising because that's kind of what I wanted to do was advertising. And I thought I'd be able to do animated commercials in New York City. And, uh, and then a friend of mine was working over at Disney and he says, Hey, you know, why don't you send your portfolio over? Cause he goes, they really need some help getting a movie finished. And so I said, all right, well, you know, let me do that. And I could work on a picture and then I'll go back to New York. And so I, I sent my portfolio over to Disney and they hired me right away. And I, I, uh, started working in the special effects department on a film called the black cauldron. Yes. And uh, one of the lesser successful Disney animated films, um, uh, but but does have a, a special place in my heart because it was the first picture I ever worked on. Yes, and I, yes. you know, it was crazy because I thought, well, I'll work on this picture and I'll just save up as much money as I can and I'll head back to New York. And I did a lot of overtime and all I was doing was like I started my first week there, I worked six days. I worked Saturday. And then after five months, I started working seven days a week to get that picture finished and just was, was making tons of money because I was getting paid overtime and golden time and all this stuff. And I didn't have any time to spend the money. I was just putting it all in the bank. And I figured uh, by the time that picture was getting finished, you know, I'd, I'd get laid off and, you know, maybe spend a month on the beach figuring out what I wanted to do and, and then go back to New York. And, uh, and so towards the end of that picture, they actually started laying people off. And I saw people I had been working with who had been there for years. I was the, the last guy hired into the department. So I thought, well, I'll be the first guy let go. And they're letting all these people go around me. And, Finally, it was May of 1985, and I was working on one of the last um, uh, special effects scenes in the picture. And I finally went down the hall to the production manager, and I said, hey, you know, Don, who's a friend of mine now, I said, Don, you know, can you give me a sense of when you're going to lay me off so I can just <laughs> kind of plan ahead? And he looked up at me, and he says, Oh, Dave, we're not going to lay you off. He goes, you've been working so hard. We're keeping you. Wow. <laughs> and, I, and I think my jaw hit the floor and my eyes became saucers. And, uh, <laughs> and I, was, I was like so surprised. And I said, well, can I at least take a couple weeks off just to rest? <laughs> I've, been working, <laughs> I've been working so hard, you know? Yes. And, uh, and so I wound up taking a little bit of a vacation. But, but that was kind of how I, I wound up getting in there. And, and I thought, I, I literally thought for the next like five pictures I worked on that at the end of each one, oh, this, at the end of this picture, I'll get laid <laughs> off. And, 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 I, and like all of a sudden, like 32 years later, I was like, wow, you know, I mean, you look back and you go, what a career. Exactly. You know? Oh, my goodness. And, and for those of you who maybe don't know, we're talking the, the types of pictures you got to work on that you played an integral role in, The Little Mermaid, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, the Rescuers Down Under, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King, Pocahontas, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Hercules, every single one, it feels like, uh, these treasured, um, what are now classics who we pass on to our children and our grandchildren. What an incredible career. Yeah, you know, it, it was really a lot of fun. And, you know, when you're working on pictures like that, you don't, you don't really know uh, you know, uh, what it's going to be like. I mean, you know, you, you, you're enjoying yourself, you're creating art, you're working with hundreds of other artists to create these animated pictures and you're not sure how they'll be received when they go out. And it's certainly gratifying, obviously, when, when you work on a picture that becomes really almost an instant classic, the way Beauty and the Beast did. In fact, the interesting thing about Beauty and the Beast was when that was released to the theaters, 
we started getting all these reports at the studio that uh, the theaters were, were selling out evening shows that they were like, it was becoming a date movie. <laughs> and, and, and that was really kind of uh, incredible. I thought, you know, absolutely. So, yeah. It still is. I think it still is. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it, it's pretty amazing. But that image of you working on your first film and the amount of perspiration required, uh, we, we were talking a little bit before the podcast about Thomas Edison and how he once said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And for so many people, the work of artists, animators like yourself, we we look to you to inspire us. And so could you talk a little bit about bringing ideas to life through animations and and how you know for us it's we only see that one percent of what really goes into uh these these storylines that we fall in love with well you know i i mean to me and this really i think applies to anything to do with the arts of creating something whether you're creating a painting or writing a book or creating a piece of music it, it really starts in your head um, and, and when I was, uh, animating at the studio, um, you know, I'd get a scene and I'd go over the scene with, you know, the, the effects supervisor and, and usually the director to, to get a sense of what it was that they were looking for, you know, and some, some scenes were straightforward and you knew exactly what you needed to do, but, but other scenes, you know, you really needed to kind of get into the head of the, the director, the storyteller of that picture uh, and understand what they were looking for. And, uh, and you had to be aware of where your work fit into the whole of the picture. Um, and, um, you know, with special effects, for the most part, special effects are like a supporting character to the actual characters in the film. And, Oftentimes in a, in a picture, uh, the special effects become the dominant feature. You know, there's some sort of climactic, spectacular thing um, uh, where it requires a lot of special effects work to, to really help tell that story point convincingly. And, uh, and so for me, after talking with the, the director and the, the effects supervisor, I oftentimes went back to my office and sat in a chair and, and just literally closed my eyes and started thinking about that scene until I was able to actually visualize it and visualize exactly how I was going to approach it and how I was going to draw that scene. And, and that's really you know, what I often do even today, whether I'm, you know, if I do a sculpture or I'm, you know, in the midst of writing another book, uh, I, my mind is constantly working and thinking about that. Uh, and then at some point it comes out of your hands and you create. And, and that's really how I look at it. I love that image of you taking that moment to close your eyes. It sounds like the inspiration sort of happens in those small, more quiet moments for you. Yeah. And, and you know, the funny thing is, is like the managers and, and bean counters uh, often thought you were goofing off and wasting time, you know. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and to me, it really was a uh, major part of what you were going to create. You had to sit and just really sort of think about it and, uh, uh, and, and really sort of, you know, block everything else out and focus your, your mind on that one thing. What was that going to look like? How are you going to start that? How are you going to choreograph the, the animation uh, for that scene? And, and it's hugely, hugely important. You know, I'm thinking of, the the time that many companies now are giving to their employees to just be free uh, you know google giving i think it's 20 percent of employees time and saying you have to spend 20 percent of your work week not working and then apply that that thinking and those um the, the insights that you uncover during that time to the rest of your work i guess one question i have is did you feel did you ever feel guilty about making that time to just sit and be quiet or did you feel a lot of pressures from the outside to look productive in those times that you knew pr productivity was happening but maybe earlier in your career did you 
feel guilty or worried that that you didn't seem as though you were, uh, <laughs> you know, making things happen in those moments. No, I I never really uh, uh, felt that guilty about it. I, I you know probably early on I didn't really have that much uh, time to sit around and do that because when you enter into the you know whatever business it is, but you know, when I entered Disney, I entered at a low level position, you know, so I was I was called an in betweener, so I was filling in drawings. So essentially the vision of the scene had already been worked out by the animator and, you know, the assistant brought it to a certain point and then it came down to me where I filled in additional drawings. Uh, So there wasn't as much uh, in the way of uh, having to think about what it was going to be. But as I progressed through um, the ranks and became an animator and a supervising animator and a visual effects supervisor, you know, those are the places where you start to take that time to sit down and just really visualize what it is you're going to do. And each artist has their own process, their own way of doing that. You know, some people will sit and, and just start drawing and thumbnailing stuff out. Other people are going to sit for a little bit, maybe a couple of hours or a half a day and just think about things. And, you know, Companies today that are giving their employees that the time to to you know uh, take for themselves, you, well, whatever job you're doing, you're never really not doing it because you're thinking about it either on a conscious or a subconscious level. Your mind is always going, and you're always thinking whether you're you know uh, uh, writing code for uh, something. Um, you know, which to me is a very creative process. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, But, you know, people have to think about that. Um, uh, So, you know, driving to work, driving home from work while you're sleeping, your mind is still working and still processing what it is that you're doing or going to do. That's so true. Yes, absolutely. And really accepting where creativity lives for us on an individual level, I think, is, is really powerful advice that you're speaking to. You know, for most of the innovation leaders that we're interviewing on this podcast, we ask them what role storytelling plays in the art of innovation. But I kind of want to reverse engineer the question for you and ask what role does innovation play in the art of storytelling? Well, you know, uh, to me, uh, I think that uh, uh Anything that you're going to work on, uh, and, I, and I have some good examples of this, um, and, and maybe I'll just jump in and tell you, like, just the simple act of writing a book um, drove me to invent something <laughs> that didn't exist. And so it was, uh, I was writing the book on Dolly and Disney, uh, Destino, yeah. and it was a collaboration in 1946 between Salvador Dali and Walt Disney on a short film that was going to go into a a Fantasia-like movie. And as I was writing that book, I kept thinking to myself, I want people to see that short film because even though Dali and Disney didn't finish the film in 1946, I was part of a team that finished the film in 2003. And so we have this wonderful six minute short film. And as I was writing the story uh, about that collaboration between these two 20th century artists, these two titans of the art world, um, I kept thinking to myself in the back of my mind, I wanted people to be able to see the movie. And why couldn't we put the movie into the book? Mm. And, And so to me, um, I just kept thinking about that and I sought out a person who was working over in Imagineering at, at Disney that uh, was an expert in display technology. And, and I, I introduced myself to him and, and we got together for a coffee and, um, uh, and we, uh, you know, I told him what I wanted to do and, uh, we wound up building a prototype. Uh, I took a I took a book and and I 
you know, cut out some of the pages up front and we put a screen in and we embedded the movie on a chip and had a play button and everything. And, and I shot, I shot a little like less than a minute, um, uh, teaser uh, on my iPhone. And I, and I emailed it to the publishing people that were publishing my book. And I said, I think we should do this maybe as a special edition or something like that. And I got a call like in five minutes after I sent that and they flipped out. They couldn't believe it. You know, they had never seen anything like that wow. before. And, the, and, and we wound up putting it together and it took, it took about two years to get it to market because it had never been done before. And there are things like, you know, the spine of the book had to be a quarter inch taller than the thickness of all the paper uh, <laughs> that went in the book to accommodate the, the thickness of this, you know, seven inch, uh, di- you know, uh, high def screen that we put in and the electronics and the, the flat battery and all of these things. And we wound up putting it all together. And it was, to me, I get the most joy when I go out to speak about Destino because I usually bring a copy of that book and I will stick my finger up inside the cover and press the on button and I'll hold the book up and then I open it and they see the movie playing on a screen and there's this, oh, oh, <laughs> that goes across the audience, you know, and, you know, the 100 or 150 people that you're talking to and they all go, oh, oh, my, you know, like they've <laughs> never seen that before. And I get such a charge out of that. But, but that to me is, is my thinking process is that no matter what you're doing, how can you uh, wow people or entertain somebody or do something different that people haven't seen before. And, and that was a case of taking existing technology uh, and merging it into a book uh, and, and being able to do that. Um, you know, again, I, I think if I hadn't built the prototype of it and I just explained it to somebody at publishing, they would have patted me on the set, head and said, oh, that's nice, Dave. You know, <laughs> now go back to work and finish that book. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. I think sometimes you just have to take a leap of faith and just go do something. But, you know, to me, um, that's the fun about creating a stuff. And, and it all it all boils down to story and I don't care what you're involved with. You know, if you're, if you're hawking, uh, you know, new sparkling water, there's a story to be told, you know, and you got to figure out what is that story that you want to tell to people. Um, you know, obviously when, when I write books, one of, one of the, um, the best compliments I get from people is I felt like you were sitting next to me telling me the story. Yes. Yeah. You know, absolutely. And, and and that's you know that that to me is the best compliment I can get from somebody when when they you know read one of my books is for them to say that to me because that that to me is w- what it's all about. You're telling stories, and and again, I think this touches people no matter what you're doing in your life. You could be working. You could have a fast food restaurant. What is the story you're telling about that fast food restaurant? You know, everything has a story around it. Yes, totally agree. When you're when you're thinking about, you know, when you're sort of stepping into a new project, whether that's a book or uh, another picture, you know, what, what do you sort of envision as your key hope when it comes to audience engagement? You know, what what's your vision when you step in? Well, obviously, with anything you do you know, you, you'd like people to, to be able to enjoy it. You know, I mean, the last couple of years I've been writing full time and I've put out a number of books. And so for me, the hope is, is that I'll get a comment from somebody who says, Oh, I read, read your latest book and I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, I, I put out a book, uh, about a year, a little over a year ago, um, about the animation furniture that I, that I worked on at the studio. Yes, yes, I've, I've yeah, looked into that. The, it's so the, interesting. The, right. And, and so um, it was kind of interesting. When I left Disney, I had been working on one of these Chem Weber desks that was built in 1939. And uh, when I was leaving, 
uh, they said, would you like your desk? And I was like, wow, absolutely. And I'm actually sitting at this 1939 Chem Weber animation desk talking to you. Wow. And this is where I write my books now. And, you know, I was sitting here working on a book that's coming out next year. And I kind of sat back as I was typing one day and I started just kind of looking at the desk and, you know, you have flashbacks of memories from different pictures you worked on and stuff like that. But I I started sitting here looking at the desk as I'm doing right now, as I tell you this story. And I thought, I wonder if anybody's written anything about this furniture because this was specialized furniture that was created for the animation process at the Walt Disney Studios. Right. And I I wonder if anybody has documented this. And so, you know, I I wound up blowing the afternoon doing research on that instead of writing on the book that I was working on. (laughs) And and, and it turned out there really was no documentation uh, on it. And I decided this would make a great book. I want to do this book. And then I was met with... um, uh, the you know from the publishers. Uh, well, it's kind of a niche topic, Dave. You know who's really going to buy this book? You know, we you know we don't see you know they didn't see it as something that you know they could sell you know twenty five thousand copies of, and so everybody passed on it. And I still decided, well, I'm going to go do this book anyway because I want to do it. It was an homage to the furniture I had worked on for 32 years at the studio that I'm still working on today, that this I felt like this furniture had a soul to it, and there was a story to be told. And so I just went ahead and did it, and I found Ken Weber's archives up in Santa Barbara, uh, found a lot of great material there and images and a lot of his artwork and early designs and all of that. And I, I did the book and I, I, I published it. Yes, you know? yes. and, and, and the book has gone out and it's been really well received and it's won a bunch of awards, which is crazy. <laughs> Well, you think about there's so much conversation, even just in the innovation community around or in the business community around what configuration will lead to the most collaboration or creativity or, you know, how space and and, and impacts the the work that we do and, and our productivity, our relationships, our motivation. It's so built into every aspect of uh, of sort of how we work and looking at a piece of furniture like your desk and the way that it was designed to facilitate creativity in the animation work and and to enable you to work in a way that was different, uh, to produce a product that was different from any other that had ever been created before. I, I get it. I, I think that it's it's it is something that can would be of interest to people across their, you know, across their different business or personal interests. It's fascinating. Yeah. And and so, you know, I have the luxury now to just decide, oh, I'm going to go do that and just do it, you know? (laughs) And and so I think that's kind of, you know, a, a fun thing. I also think it's a very important thing because oftentimes people will say, I'm going to do that, or I wish I could do that, or someday I'm going to do X. And and then they never do. And and for me, when I decide, oh, I'm going to do something like put a you know a, a video screen in a book or uh, write a book on furniture and you know anything like that, I go ahead and follow through on it. I just do it. And I think that's a hugely important thing. However crazy some of the ideas that we each come up with. Um, there's validity to them and there's things that you should go and try and, you know, and, and maybe it won't work out, but maybe it'll lead you to something else. Uh, and, and I think that's, you know, that, that's the fun of it, you know, that, yeah. that, that discovery. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm wondering too, would you speak to the power that animation has to create new worlds to really Complete, really, in, in some ways, when 
when you're facing the opportunity to create an animated story, you, at least from an outsider's perspective, it seems as though you have hardly any limitations. Right? You could be in outer space in Gamma Quadrant 10. You could be under the water. You can um, have characters that aren't human. You can really, everything that defines reality for most people can get completely turned on its head inside the world of animation. So how do you innovate when you have no limitations? Well, I, you know, I think that most people put constraints on themselves. Um, I think people, um, you know, immediately, I, it's almost like people are conditioned to say no. Um, that, that, you know, as you grow up, you know, <laughs> I want to go do this. No, you can't do that. Uh, or you can't do it that way. You need to do it this way. This is the way we're teaching you how to do something. Uh, and I think there's a natural uh, tendency for people to, to jump to no. Um, I used to have fun at the studio because I made it a point to try and uh, turn a no into a yes. Okay. And I did it. And I was able to do it most of the time. Oh, uh, could you give me it, some examples? Well, it, it was just sort of like, you know, I'd like to go and uh, uh you know, uh, make a documentary while I'm working on a project that uh, is requiring me to do a lot of scoring sessions. I'd like to do a documentary about um, music and animation. And it was sort of met with a, well, why do you want to do that? <laughs> and I was like, well, because it hadn't, it hadn't really been covered. It hasn't been documented. And because I'm doing the scoring sessions, it would be easy for me to just film some of this stuff and then interview composers and things like that. Uh, well, uh, well, uh, I don't know if, well, I'm not sure. And then I'd go back and say, look, I, I, I've already, I'm paying for the scoring session for this project. We're doing it at Capitol Records. We're in a historic recording studio, stage A at Capitol Records. I really want to film some of this stuff, you know? And it finally was like, well, what are you going to do with it? I go, well, it, it'll be educational. It'll give some insight into how we do things. And, you know, it could go into film festivals and bloody blah, blah. Uh, okay, all right. Well, go ahead and do it. You know? So passion. Uh, <laughs> so passion yeah. played a big role. <laughs> Persistence. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, and uh, and, and so, you know, I, I tend to approach things that way. And, uh, and, and, and think beyond whatever it is that I'm doing, you know, how, how can I, you know, I, I've been giving lots of thought about, you know, the, the writing books. And, and when I did that Cam Weber book on furniture, I really felt like, um, I needed to, uh, uh, elevate the book itself to a piece of art. Um, and, and so I was very much involved with, you know, talking to the printer and picking out a heavier, uh, matte finish, uh, paper stock and all the images that went in the book. I wanted to put spot varnish on, and I really wanted the book to have, like when people felt it, there was a tactile experience yeah. to it. Um, and, and, and I had a number of people say to me that the book itself was a work of art, um, because of the printing, uh, techniques that we used. And I, and it was very collaborative because I was talking to the printer and saying, you know, what are some of the cool things that we can do? And he would be showing me samples of stuff and, uh, and, you know, and we decided to put some wood texture onto the cover of the book. So when you first pick up the book, you, you feel, you can feel the wood grain on the, on the cover of the book. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that was sort of, a, a, you know, just high concept wise, a, you know, bringing you into this world of this wooden furniture that was built for the Disney studios. And, um, and, and so, you know, that, that's kind of how my mind works when I'm, when I'm dealing with these types of projects is, is, is to how do you do something different that hasn't been done before so that, you know, what you're working on isn't just the run of the mill, you know? Absolutely. I love getting lost on your website, actually. And I highly recommend this to, to people listening 
to, to, to hop over to davidbossert.com and especially check out some of the articles and essays. And obviously your books are incredible. And um, but, but these articles, I'm fascinated. You, you clearly have a passion for history and sort of uncovering lost stories. And one of the ones I read was about the Mickey Mouse gas mask. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. That, you know, and, and, and I, I actually, uh, at a future date, I'm taking all of those essays that I've written on World War II uh, and Disney. Uh, they're all going into a book uh, Good. With, with expanded information and more images and stuff like that. But, you know, this is the it's a passion of mine. To and and more so today because there's such you know division in this country and really around the world it seems that you know that 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 you know people are so divided and angry and you know the political situation is is, is just so unfriendly um, and yeah. and I'm so fascinated by that period in World War II because, you know, the, it, it's dubbed the greatest generation. And it was a period when everybody pulled together, everybody, you know, they, everybody just, you know, whether you went into the military and served or you stayed at home and served your country by working in the factories to turn out planes and tanks and whatnot. Everybody just seemed to come together during that period. And the Disney studio was no different. They were, they were part of that. They contributed greatly creating training films and, and, and all kinds of things, you know, and, and when, when the government came knocking, they answered the call. And and I there, there's just such a wonderful warmth about that period, even though it's it's part of a horrific world war. Yeah, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And and so finding all those individual stories, um, uh, you know, like the Mickey Mouse gas mask and how that came about and what the thinking was and the fact that. The, the British were telling children with their gas masks that it was Mickey Mouse, even though it wasn't, you know, they were using that term to try and uh, yeah. soften it and, and quell the nerves of the children when they were going into air raid shelters. Yeah. So then, and then at that point, Walt Disney Company embraced it and said, you know, let's make a real Mickey Mouse exactly. gas mask yeah, and, it, and alleviate exactly. their fears. Really, yeah, it's an incredible story. I, I love your writing. You know, thank you very much. In, in fact, they made they made a tin uh, for the British that had the Mickey Mouse characters on the tin for the kids to put their gas mask in. It, <laughs> yeah. was, it was like a you know their, their little their little uh, a holder for for the gas mask, and you know so you're taking you know uh, these these horrible things that are going on in, in daily life. And you're actually trying to soften them a little bit, you know, and yeah. and, and put people at ease. And, and and I just thought, you know, there there's a lot of those kinds of stories to be told that nobody really has delved into and, and talked that much about. Uh, and so for me, th those things are fascinating. I, I think that they are um, uh, pieces of history that you want to document um, yes, yeah. so that they don't get lost to time like so much stuff has. And I think by sharing those moments of innovation and creativity in our history, it inspires us to think that way today and think how on earth or, or why would we, you know, create a, a gas mask with, with Mickey Mouse's face, right? But when you when you look back and you see that moment in the context and in the history, it's it's clear that thinking outside the box and really trying to to do something bigger sometimes takes that that level of of creativity. So yeah, I think it's it's inspiring and it reminds us to to think in, in a collaborative way and and to to perhaps embrace things that may on the surface seem you know, impossible or strange. 
And gosh, isn't that part of the entire history of Disney and, and the, the films that have come out even since then? Well, you know, the amazing thing is, is that, you know, when I worked on those pictures, especially in, in the period that they now refer to as the Renaissance of animation, um, uh, which is the 19, late, late 80s, and 1990s, um, uh, you realize when you're working on stuff that what you're doing, regardless of what you're doing, it's going to touch somebody in some way. Um, maybe, maybe in a little way or maybe in a very profound way. Um, I remember when we worked on, uh, the Lion King, um, there, after it was released to theaters, the studio received some letters and one in particular really stands out to me. And I sometimes get choked up when I talk about it, but it was from, uh, a woman who lost her husband. Uh, the father of her son, mm. uh, and uh, the Lion King, because Simba loses his father in the film, yeah. um, that so touched them uh, because of their loss, and it helped, she wrote that it helped her son get through that difficult period. Oh, sure. To, to, to understand, you know, the circle of life and, and, you know, uh, uh, the fact that, you know, he needed to go on and, and continue on and his father would always be with him, you yes, know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that there's such a responsibility for our world's greatest storytellers to, um, meet us where we're at. And that's the, the genius, uh, of the, the films that you've worked on and, uh, and the ones that keep continuing to come out, that re that way that we can relate and really uh, put our lives in the context of these these bigger stories. You know, and 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 that's so true, and and that's true of the entire film industry, not just animation, but film in general. Um, you know, it, it 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 draws us in, it entertains us, it makes us laugh, it makes us cry, um, it makes us think about things deeper. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things I've always loved about filmed entertainment. Um, and you know, why I, you know, certain movies I can watch over and over and over again because they just resonate with me. Yeah, for sure. You know, if you were to give advice to people who are wanting to be innovative or who are leading innovation teams, whether that's, you know, in, in really across all industries and at all ages and all, you know, talent areas, what would, what advice would you give, especially sort of pulling from the lessons you've learned as an animator and special effects artist? Well, I, I, I think that there's a lot of validity to just sort of that blue sky process of, you know, throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks um, and, you know, one of the things we used to do oftentimes at the beginning of pictures is, is just that we, we just start throwing ideas out. Um, and however ridiculous an idea might be, maybe enough to spark a colleague to say, yeah, but you know what, what about this? And that leads you down this path of, you know, what could we do? What can this be? What could that be? And, uh, but at the end of the day, these, these films that we worked on, it was all about having a really strong story with endearing characters set in a world that we'd want to visit multiple times mm -hmm. that we'd want to keep coming back to. And that's really what, what it's all about. You have to start with the story and expand from there. Yeah, definitely. That that's a beautiful image, and I love that idea of t being bold and taking risks in order to not only just have that idea be the winner, but in order to let that be the assist <laughs> to another team member who might be able to, to rein it in or reapply or build upon it to get everyone moving in the direction it's meant to go. Absolutely, you know, it's it, it, it's just to me, it's a, it's an extremely fun process. Uh, and, it, and it's one that has to be allowed to take its course. 
Um, you know, again, I, I talk about throwing ideas against the wall to see what sticks, but that to me is, is a big part of, uh, of the creative process is to, you know, to, to push yourself to think outside the norm, outside the box, uh, and, and to, to push the envelope. Uh, and, and again, it, it, it's so true for whatever business you're in. It's not just you know, related to the, to the film business or the animation business uh, or music, it, you know, you can put this thinking into place out in the world anywhere. Yeah, I completely agree 100%. So, uh, Dave, I'm so grateful that you made the time today to talk with us about creativity and invention and persistence. And, um, and you can follow David on social media at Dave underscore Bossert and check out his website, David Bossert, read his books. And um, I'm so grateful for all the insights you shared today. It was absolutely my pleasure. I really enjoyed talking with you. And um, uh, I, I, hope, I hope what I had to say uh, uh, may resonate with somebody out there in the world. I'm sure. Yes, it definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.